When I talk, they listen. This is what they've been missing. This podcast is what they've been missing. When I talk, they listen. This is what they've been missing. This podcast is what they've been missing. When I talk, they listen. This is what they've been missing. This podcast, this is what they've been missing. When I talk, they listen. This is what they've been missing. This podcast is what they've been missing. Welcome to this episode of Mark My Words, where my guests agree to talk, I, your host, agree to listen as you agree to eavesdrop. My guest today is a multifaceted individual whose life has been marked by both extraordinary achievements and significant challenges. Introducing to some and presenting to others, the first Hispanic elected Rochester City Court Judge, Leticia Stashi. How are you today? Good. How are you? I won't complain. How are you feeling today? I, I won't complain either. I'll follow your suit. <laughs> okay, okay. So I want to dive right into this uh, multifaceted individual that you are. Um, I discovered you myself by the media. Uh, I was watching the media as they covered some things about you, some of your challenges. But throughout watching that, I don't know why, I just was able to see through their depiction. And I started Googling and researching you to get to know you more because unfortunately at the time, you, you weren't really in the public because of the media. So I was like, I just got to find out myself of who she is. And what I found out, I became very interested in you as a person. Um, I think that you have a lot to offer even to the viewers. So that's why I'm honored to be in your presence here on the show. Um, thank you. And look forward to our discussion today. So with that said... Just start off by telling us who is Leticia Stasio, Stasio, excuse me, meaning where were you born, what part of the city, what were some of your challenges growing up, what type of parents, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I, it's funny. I feel like everybody knows this story at this point, but <laughs> I was born on the northwest side of Rochester off of Lyle Avenue. Um, I'd like to say for reference points that I was down the street from the cordial and everybody pretty much knows what that means in Rochester. Okay. So um, that was where I lived down the street from the cordial. I grew up on Sherman Street. I was in the urban suburban program. Um, I had typical struggles of being um, a young person growing up in Rochester. I grew up in, in poverty. My parents dealt with substance abuse issues. Um, you know, we dealt with domestic violence issues and abuse and, and just unfortunately the normal things that a lot of um, young people in Rochester have to experience. And through that, um, my parents always were very adamant to me that education was incredibly important. Mm -hmm. Even though that wasn't something that they had necessarily pursued, they kind of presented that as the path to not having to work so hard and being able to transcend um, this glass ceiling to a degree. If you could become educated enough, you could um, be able to um, make a means for yourself and not have to worry and struggle. And so very early on, I think one of the things that kind of changed the trajectory of my life is that my parents put me in the urban suburban program. And that meant that I, even though I lived in a poor part of the city, really didn't spend very much time there. Mm -hmm. um, I went to school in West Rondequay. Getting back and forth took up my entire day. Okay. You know, just catching the bus was enough to take the entire day up. And so that kind of changed um, my friends and the people that I knew and the relationships that I had dramatically because I was not interacting with most of the people that lived around me. And I wasn't interacting too much with the people in Rondequay either because of the barrier in terms of transportation. So it was a lot of, you know, go to school, go home. Okay. You mentioned that both of your parents was on, uh, under some sense of control substance. What specific control substance was it? Well, I was an, I was an 80s baby. Um, okay. So my parents suffered from the crack epidemic that so many of our parents did. Okay. Um, and thank God they were both able to get clean before I was anywhere near being an adult. Um, they had a remarkable journey and they, they fixed it. But when I was younger, that was my experience. So, and the reason I pointed that out is because you said they also put you in urban suburban. So their mind wasn't just all the way gone on crack. Oh no, my <laughs> parents, yeah, my parents still parented me. Um, okay. They were very actively okay. in addiction when they put me in urban suburban and they still parented to the best of their okay. ability. Um, and, you know, and kind of always 
had struggles, like I think so many of our parents do, but had a sense of upbringing that comes from having a family and having a sense of um, pride in your family. And, you know, they, they always kind of really stood on that. Okay. And there were certain things that you did and certain ways that you behaved. Okay. Now, when you go live or when you're on social media or when you even make mention of parents these days as an adult, you often only speak of your father. Uh, your mother is still present, correct? Alive? My mother's alive, yes. Okay. Is, is there a reason for the distance of not speaking on her too much? We don't really have a relationship, unfortunately. Um, I think that a lot of people of color suffer from generational curses that they're not necessarily able to breach or to fix. And sometimes it's just easier to sever a relationship that causes her or turmoil or trauma or, you know, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. It can just be a decision that this isn't the best situation for anyone involved. And I wish you the best that you can love people from a distance. And is that amicable, that decision? I mean, I don't have any ill will towards anyone. I don't think she does. I haven't spoken to her to get her, her position on okay. it, but I don't, think, I don't think there's any ill will. I should hope not. Okay. So, but daddy, would you say daddy's little girl were you or daddy's girl? Or? No, no. Honestly, I was way closer to my mother. My father mm. had a substance abuse problem for a lot longer than she did. Okay. Um, and so he was a bit absent. And then when he got his life together, he worked mm. primarily. My father, you know, even though he's Puerto Rican, his parents are fresh off the boat. So the work ethic was insane. He worked really, really hard. He worked all the time. And he kind of felt like that was his contribution to the household, you know, being employed and, and bringing home the bacon, so to speak. So no, um, I developed a relationship with my father when I got older. Um, I mean, I never had a bad relationship with him either. Okay. I'm not, I'm pretty easy to get along with generally. Um, you know, if I, Somebody is getting on my nerves. I just get away from them. We don't normally have an issue. Um, But no, we didn't get closer until I was older. Okay. So with, I heard you say your dad's Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm. Uh, Often you you identify as black when you speak. Um, What's, how how does that come about? Like, can you tell the viewers specifically how you identify as black? Well, I mean, I'm I'm Puerto Rican and black and I never Mm -hmm. try to hide that. But I don't see a huge difference between being Puerto Rican or black. I think that's just another stop on, you know, the transatlantic slave trade. And I think that Puerto Ricans are Afro Latinas. It's the, it's the same thing. Okay. It's just a little more mixture. You probably have a little more Spaniard in you than, you know, a person who has more black in them. But um, my father is Puerto Rican and he spoke Spanish, but he didn't really speak Spanish at home okay. because my mother didn't understand Spanish. So because she's Black. Okay. So honestly, I feel like that's a very large part of the culture that you lose. Okay. Um, because you lose the language, right. you lose the music, you lose, mm-hmm. you know, my mom would make some of the food, but again, my mom is black. Okay. And so, so she seasoned it. Right. Well, she, she, you know, she made different stuff. She would make ours con pollo for my father oh. and for us because she would start to learn to cook his dishes, mm. but she didn't cook all of the dishes. She made red beans and rice. She made cabbage. You know, she made my mom made black food most of the time. Okay. And so, um, not that I have any shame or that I don't identify with being Hispanic to any capacity, just culturally, I definitely had more exposure to the black side of my family because my father was dealing with substance abuse, because my father was working, um, because I lived in the, in the city and my black family lived in the city mm. and my Puerto Rican family lived in the suburbs or, you know, in Puerto Rico. So it's not a lack of, um, you know, connection. Um, I, I love every part of Puerto Rican culture that I know. I love, you know, I think it's a beautiful culture, but I know it significantly less. And most of it that I've learned, I feel like I've done as an adult by mm-hmm. trying to go to Puerto Rico, by trying to learn Spanish in college, but, you know, trying to do things like that, whereas opposed to I didn't have to make any efforts to learn black culture. It was right there. Right. You know I, what I mean? <laughs> I understood. Totally understood. So as a child in your urban living in the urban uh, uh, in the inner city, how did that pl- did you go into urban suburban play a role in you being the successful person you became? Undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. I have many criticisms about urban suburban, mm-hmm. um, but the um, access to education that you get and the limited access to BS 
and mm. drama that you're able to benefit from is is pretty much unmatched. And I, I think that it's an amazing program for those reasons, because it's difficult to find a similar experience in a non-private school in the city. So when you say the limited access to like mess, is that like, can you say that when you go more to an urban suburban, there's not as much like competition or bullying competition as in what you have on? Yeah. Well, there's not as much like being worried that pressure. somebody's going to drive their car across the campus while you're going to class or come mm. to the school and try to shoot you while you're going in the door. Those things. I'm not saying that nothing happens in the suburbs. Not at all. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying that things like that generally don't happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you might have other types of school shooting situations, but it's not as frequent. It's not as common. And it's definitely not um, I don't know. I would say it's scary. It's, it's scary sometimes for our kids going to school. And mm -hmm. the last thing that they have to be worried about is an education because they've got a million other things to worry about before they even get there. You know what I mean? Right. What age did you decide I want to be an attorney and what made you choose that profession? You know, <laughs> I. I wanted to be an actress when I was little. Really? I did. I can see that. <laughs> and I thought that was kind of like being an actress, but I didn't want to go to school really? forever. Um, and then when I finished getting my ma when I finished getting my associates, my mom was very much like, keep going to school, keep going to school. And I was like, no, I don't think I should. And, and so she was like, just apply. And I'm very much like, well, I'll try it, you know, mm -hmm. and if I get in, then I'm supposed to go. Okay. So when I got my bachelor's, I, after I finished that, I thought, I don't know if I really want to be done with school yet. I think I might want to try and just see. So I applied for my master's in social work, didn't even apply to law school initially. But when I got into the master's program, there was a dual degree program. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, I'll just try again okay. and see. If I'll just keep trying. <laughs> yeah, I'll just keep trying and see. <laughs> and if I get in, then I'm supposed to do it. And if it doesn't work, then I guess I'm not supposed to do it. Is that still your motto today in life? You know, it really is. Um, my situation knocked me down a peg or two at that mm -hmm. because I've never really tried something and thought, okay, this is what's supposed to happen. And then it blew up and turned into complete shit. You know, mm -hmm. normally, normally right. if, if it says this is what you're supposed to do and I do it, then the rewards are beautiful and wonderful. Mm -hmm. And it's like you did yeah. what you were supposed to do. So this particular time, it was like universe. <laughs> we had a deal and you kind of let me down. Um, but, you know, I think that sometimes your faith is tested and you're mm. supposed to come out of the other side. And, and, but, but normally that is very much my motto. I think that what's supposed to happen mm. happens. And so that was a collision, right? Because I'm like, this time what was supposed to happen didn't. Mm. And that's not what I believe. I believe that things go the way they're supposed to. Now, didn't you graduate early in high school? I graduated in high school. I graduated in the class of 99, but then I went to MCC and graduated with my associates in 2000. So that's why it seemed early because I got my associates in a year. In a year? Yeah. How did that, how did that happen? You got it within a year. Because I do crazy stuff and I'd be <laughs> like, oh, you know, I'm going to do this. And I went to MCC and I started over the summer and I said, I want to take 18 credits. And they said no. And I harassed them and annoyed them until they said I could do it. And then I got like a 4.0 and they said, you can take as many classes as you want now. Mm. So then I took like 21 credits the next semester and like six credits during the winter break. And I think 24 credits my last semester. And then I went for one more summer and I was like, okay, great. Okay. So it was, I got out of my associates program early, but then because of that, I got out of my bachelor's program and two years instead of the three years that it would have taken. So I got a bachelor's in three years total instead of four. And so it just kept happening. Everything kept being early. Yeah. But all due to your intelligence, basically. Well, you know, it's so really, I think, all due to my daughter, because I don't <laughs> even think I'm nearly as smart as I was then. Like, I don't know that I could do that at this okay. stage in my life. But I was so incredibly motivated um, to make a different life for her that I don't think the concept of failure ever crossed my mind. You know, it was just mm -hmm. like, this is what you're going to do. If this happens, you got to do whatever it takes to do it. This is what you're going to do. And that's right. very much how it was. So you mentioned daughter. What age were you when you started having children, your first child? Because you have two children, right? Yeah, I got pregnant with Jaya when I was 16. With who? Jaya. That's okay. my daughter. I actually had her when I was 17. Okay. And so when I had her, it was kind of like it lit a fire. Like, whoa, I was, I, I always say this, I had a job at Arby's. I made $4.15 an hour. And I was like, oh, my God, 
who's gonna feed this thing? <laughs> How in the world am I gonna do this? And me and my mom were like rocky already at that mm. point. Um, my dad had again been like providery, but very absent. They had separated and been together and separated and been together. So he was like living next door to his mother. And I could come there, but like she made dinner for him every day. So he'd be like, go to your grandma's to eat dinner. There's no food. It was just like a weird, weird situation. Mm. It was like, what in the world have you gotten yourself into, girl? When your mother says, when you say your mother kind of was at odds at that time, was she disappointed at the young pregnancy? Oh, definitely. Absolutely. My mother um, flirted on and off throughout my life with being incredibly Christian. Mm. incredibly incredibly christian so i remember when we had a conversation and i told her that i was pregnant she said a child left on their own brings disgrace upon their mother Mm. i was like congratulations whoa (laughs) now she was saying this at the time using cocaine as well no 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 oh at that time she was clean my mom was yeah both of my parents were done using drugs before i was 10. okay okay but i was going to say the audacity no. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, she wasn't. She, she would have said it then, so okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> she would have said it then, so. <laughs> okay. So. But no, but she was she was very much into the church then. Okay. You know, I, a lot of times I think people often have to find something else to rely on. Mm-hmm. Not that I'm saying church is wrong, but that's sometimes a help to get out of a substance abuse situation or a domestic mm-hmm. violence situation or and so she was heavily into the church at that time, though, and she would quote Bible scriptures. And so that's that's a Bible scripture somewhere. I don't know where. OK, <laughs> so your son comes along how soon after your daughter? My son comes along when I am literally in my first year of law school, which. OK, so I'm I think I'm 21 um, and Jai is around five or six. And it was just like. If I don't have a baby, I'm not going to have a baby. They're going to be too far apart. I didn't okay. plan on having any more babies. So it's like, all right, we're going to have a baby. And we did. And for, but I, I say all the time, apparently, school is not difficult enough for me. I need to have a, a child or I'm not challenged. Yeah, I have to oh. pair the two. <laughs> okay. So at either of the births, were you married or they both were out of wedlock? No, I was not married at either birth. Okay. So how does it sound here out of wedlock? With your mother being a Christian, did she ever use that term? Um, yeah, I don't care. I don't okay. really care too much about marriage. Okay. I mean, I got married afterwards, but I also got divorced, so clearly that wasn't such a grand idea. Now, how soon <laughs> did you get a divorce after you got married? I think it was, I, I think we might have made it almost three years mm-hmm. before the marriage was final. So the marriage was final within three years. How about the relationship, the emotional connect? Like The relationship, no, was significantly longer. Marriage was the kiss of death. Mm. Because, you know, not for nothing, but people get really hung up on this. Not every woman's goal is to be married. Okay. So I didn't want to get married. But what he proposed? Or you just he proposed like- a million times. And he wanted to get married, and it was important to him. And I was like, fine. But very shortly after, I felt trapped. I felt mm. like, you do stuff I don't like, and you're right. going to do it for the whole rest of my life? That <laughs> sounds horrible. That we were divorced by the time I got 33. By the time I was 33, we were divorced. Because I remember by the time I won the election, mm-hmm. we were going through a divorce okay. already. So how was he with your children, even though they were his? Oh, well, only one of them isn't his biologically. Oh, okay. And so- he literally adopted her. So he was... The father to my children. He's right. known um, my daughter since she was you know, actually he's just... been in her life since she was 18 months old. Okay. So he on, she only knows that he's not biologically her father because I literally told her. Okay. okay. He, he literally adopted her and has been there for her entire recollection. And he's still in their life? No. No. Okay. No. All right. So, so how do you feel? You're, but they're uh, adults now. Right. How, and how old are they? Jaya is 25 and Corey is 19. And they're all on their own? Yeah. Okay. How do you feel your upbringing uh, trickled over into theirs? Was it because you had to sound like a lot of challenges coming up? Do you feel like you allowed that to not become for your kids? 
You know, I think that in retrospect, I focused on things like I don't beat you, I don't get beat, I don't smoke crack, uh, we have stable housing, you know, I try to put you in the same school district. And I think that there were huge things that I totally missed. Mm. You know what I mean? Like the fact that um, my parents or my mother, more specifically, her connection centered a lot around her own substance abuse and my father's own substance abuse and kind of needing a friend almost. And when that changed and I got a little older and had an opinion and she also was not in that vulnerable position, our relationship changed dramatically. So I can look at my own children and say, wow, around the time that they turned seven or eight, I am much more emotionally disconnected than I would have ever chosen to be intentionally as a parent. Mm. You know what I mean? Yes. It's like, you're too old for affection. Okay. You're too old. You know what I mean? Okay. And it's like, oh, wow. I didn't even notice mm. the way that trauma, like I said, is generational. Right. And you learn what you live, even when you're trying to unlearn bad habits, the ones that are loudest to you are the ones that you focus on. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Those are the ones that you see. And if you can fix them, then you're like, whoa, look at me. Mm -hmm. You don't even realize the other ones that you thought weren't so damaging. So what law school did you go to? UB. UB. Okay. So when you took the bar, how many times did it take for Leticia Stasso to take the bar and pass it? One. One? Yes. That's great. That's great. As you know, that test is super. I think Jesus difficult. just really wanted me to be a lawyer and knew that I might just say F it if I didn't pass it because it was a horrible experience. Because there you go with that motto. If it's for me, I'll right. pass. If it's not, then I guess God just wanted me to have a law degree for no apparent reason. <laughs> okay. So how old were you when you passed the bar exam? Um, I don't know. Probably 24. Okay. It was in 2006. It was probably in 2005, actually, because the bar is before you get admitted. Yeah, 2005 is the bar. And then 2006, you're actually admitted after you pass character and fitness. And they say you're a good enough human being to be a lawyer. Wait, that's new to me. So wait, you have to take the bar exam and then there's still some qualifications. Oh, after that. yeah, there's hoops you jump through and you have to prove that you have the proper character and fitness mm. to be admitted to the bar. Mm. And I'm like... Y'all should have asked me three years ago because right. I don't want to do all of this for right. no reason. Right. Um, but yeah, at the end, you have to have to do more stuff. Okay. So now you're going into law, practicing law. What, what you started practicing law about what year, what age at that time? It was 2006. I was born in 81. You want me to do math? I was like, I was like 25. Okay. So now you're 25, a mother of two, and an attorney, okay, coming from Sherman Street area, down street from Corsair. Okay, so how, what made you want to really get into law, though? What was your reason? I know you said earlier that you originally wanted to be an actress, but now... Most people get in law and they have a, a reason of why they want to do so. Oh, well, yeah, no. I mean, I thought that that was cool because I thought that... I didn't see the parallels initially. I just thought that law was an interesting career and I'd always liked watching like law shows. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. Um, but then when I started going to law school and kind of thinking of my own experiences with the law that I had had um, with family court, with criminal court, with family members in criminal court, I was like, okay, well, I could do this. I like to be an advocate for people and this would be a good job for me. Okay, that makes sense. Now you're into law. I, per some of my research, I saw that you had like some really great stats. At that time, if you recall, before you transitioned into trying to be a judge, how many cases did you win versus you lost? Oh, before, <laughs> before I became a judge, actually, I was on a streak. I had won 13 cases in a row. Mm. And it was crazy because during the campaign, I was literally campaigning and I was forced to do a trial that I didn't want to do, that mm. the DA didn't want to do. During the campaign. During the campaign. And the, the DA tried to offer a petty larceny. It was on a felony that never should have been indicted. And the judge got mad and he said, no, he wouldn't take it. And we had the trial 
And the little girl, oh, she's such a freaking little girl. It wasn't a robbery. It was a petty larceny mm. and a harassment. It was, she was stealing some stuff and a guy who was security unbeknownst to her attacked her. Mm. So she started fighting him. Defending herself. But it wasn't to steal the stuff. It was because a stranger attacked her. Oh, the jury came back. We had one black juror. She never came back from lunch. Mm. So we had all white jury and they convicted her of robbery. While you were campaigning. It was the 13th case I had and I lost. And I called my campaign manager crying and he said, I said, this is, we're, we're doomed. 13 is a horrible number. And he said, you're my 13th campaign. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Yeah, he was like, you're my 13th campaign and you're going to win. But so, yeah, that was, the, I had 13 in a row. Well, 12 in a row. I lost that one. Now, the same reason that you wanted to be attorney, was it the same that you wanted to be a judge? Yeah, I honestly, I never thought I wanted to be a judge until I was an attorney. And mm -hmm. I just got pissed about the decisions that people were making because they were so incredibly ridiculous. I was like, you like are what when you say the decision? Like sending somebody to jail for a year because they stole something from Walmart that Walmart got back before they left. <laughs> what, what are we doing right now? Do you know how expensive that is? Okay. I mean, expensive meaning on taxpayers and things like right, that. Right. Meaning that the taxpayers have to pay to put that person in jail, mm -hmm. have to pay an attorney to defend that person because they're indigent, have to pay a district attorney to prosecute that person, have to pay the judge to send him to jail. Do you know how expensive that is for us in the end of the day? Walmart has insurance. That's their business. I mean, you guys got to figure it out the best you know how. I love hearing you say this as a judge because I doubt many judges think like you. Like you, they're not like, as you just did to break that down of the charges, they would be more in favor of the money made off of this than to be like, I don't want, I want to be a judge to be against this. Yeah, because it, it, because it doesn't behoove them mm. to make the system less profitable or to make it more condensed, mm. right? Because you want to be a judge to make a bazillion dollars. And I understand it's a lucrative position. It's not, you're not going to be a billionaire, but you can actually make a difference. Mm. And, and honestly, unfortunately, crime doesn't stop. So there's going to be more people, hopefully a few less, but there's going to be more. You can actually make a difference. And I saw that, um, I saw that as a district attorney. I saw that in private practice. And when I saw it with the judges, I really liked the fact that in city court, you weren't dealing with cases that were murders, rapes, you know, things where it was like, whoa, people have really been devastated here. And you have to try to balance things where justice isn't a possibility because, you know, this has already been a wrong that you can't correct. In city court, it's like a misdemeanor. Okay. That's the most serious offense is a misdemeanor. So as a black judge at the time, black Puerto Rican, uh, is, is black Latino a proper term? <laughs> I don't mind. Okay. I just want to make sure people get so confused. I don't think I've never heard that one before, but whatever. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so when you sat on the judge seat, it sounds like then that you let a lot of people, I don't want to say the term let off, but you were more, you were more concerned of not sending specific people to jail for something as minute as a petty larceny at Walmart. Well, right. I mean, I wouldn't consider it letting someone off, right? Because right. I would say on this petty larceny, you're going to do community service. Do That's something. equivalent to what you attempted to steal so that you're giving back to the community and you're doing something. You didn't actually take anything. Like, let's just wrap our minds around because that for a second. Right. You okay. never left the store. There was a police officer there to apprehend you. Everything you were trying to take was returned to Walmart. So I don't know what huge offense you did that would justify the wrong. First of all, incarceration is horrible. So mm -hmm. what would justify something that bad when that's the worst thing we do in this country besides execute people? Mm -hmm. I think we might want to save that for special events. You know, mm -hmm. like we don't want to just hand it out to everybody. And also, it, I don't know what, we're, what that consequence is accomplishing. You right. know, a lot of times you have people who come in with these commercial PLs, they're drug users. Or they, now people literally sometimes just push carts out of stores. That's what they do for a yeah. living and sell this stuff. Everybody has a job, okay? The economy is rough. You're not going to change somebody who is doing that because that's their livelihood. You're not going to change someone who's, who's going to buy or to steal a bunch of infamil for crack because you put them in jail for a year. You're going to waste everybody's time and money. 
So you figure it's better to just do like community servers or drug court? Or, right. Or it's better to give you an alternative that actually addresses your issue or just gets the case over with because it's not a case where we're going to make any substantive change. And we should focus on the cases where we can change people mm. and do things that matter. You know? Now, Leticia, doing that, I know that your other judge colleagues did not like that that they saw that you were having this type of mindset and giving people community service versus time. So how were your challenges with like colleagues when they were known, when you were known to do that? You know, it was, it was difficult. I've actually said this a few times. One of the big fights that I would have is that I didn't generally hold people on bail for misdemeanors. I would be like, this is an accusation. You're not convicted of anything. I'm going to let you out. I'm not going to set a cash bail. And a lot of the judges didn't agree with that because um, generally, well, my interpretation is if you kept people in jail, they'd be more likely to plead guilty for disposition to get the case over with. Whereas if they get out, they're more likely to try to fight their charges because they're not in jail. They don't care as much. Um, so I would have that discussion often. And now you can't hold someone on bail for a misdemeanor offense. Mm. The law has literally changed. So it was like, oh, I was being so ridiculous, giving people the right to, you know, not be held in jail when they're accused of a, a misdemeanor. It's not even a, a, a felony. It's not violent. You know what I mean? And now the law has changed in New York State and you can't set bail on those so offenses. So you were ahead of your time. And so they, right. <laughs> you know, that's been the issue for so long. I'm like, I can't wait to see what happens in like five years. <laughs> so now you, you, you're at this point. And do you think... Honestly speaking, were you doing that strategically for the culture? No, I was doing it because I think it's the right thing to do. For any race. Yeah, I wasn't just letting black people out of jail. Bail is for whether or not you're coming back to court. And and if you didn't not come back to my court, why am I punishing you? I'm going to give you a chance to see if you come back or not. If you don't, I can set a warrant later. And and you can do that now, too. Mm -hmm. So if you don't come, that's one thing. But if you didn't not come, why am I holding you in jail when you're presumed innocent? And you're like, I think people fail to realize when they talk about bail reform that when you take somebody and you pluck them out of their life for something they're accused of, but without evidence of them actually doing it, right? They didn't go to work. They didn't get a chance to call. They didn't bring their kids to school. They didn't, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You are potentially ruining someone's life. Mm -hmm. If it's a week, they might not be able to pay their rent. Mm -hmm. And this is all over an accusation that may not be true. Mm -hmm. That's a lot to do to a person. Judges are not thinking like that. The TC, I know. They're thinking, <laughs> I'm going to let you out and you might violate my order of protection so it's easier to leave you in. Mm-hmm. I'm going to let you out. And if you get arrested again, it's easier to let you in or keep you in. But it's like, I don't, I just, I don't think that that's the way we should be thinking. Our criminal justice system. I saw something today that said it's the land of the free with the highest level of incarceration in the mm-hmm. world. But the land of the free. Yeah, that's kind of crazy. Right. Mahogany finishings. Over 15 years of experience in interior remodeling, specializing in kitchens and bathrooms. As spring and summer approaches, you're watching this considering some renovating. Stop considering and get to inboxing owner and CEO Jermel Barnes on Facebook. If you want your home replenished, let Mahogany finish. And this is our moment to mention. So I want to go to start speaking of the challenges now that we've learned who you were as a person and who you are. Uh, I want to talk about some headlines and I want to read some and then we'll go from there. Okay. So challenges and ethical lapses in your life. The public was witness to your fall of grace, fall from grace, including the 2016 drunken driving conviction and subsequent violations of post conviction mandate. How do you reflect on these events and what lessons have you learned from them? You know, I kind of alluded to it earlier. I think one thing that I learned from that is trauma definitely impacts the way that you process things and the way that you handle things. Um, I think that during that incident, it was so difficult for me, a person who had always been like, and not for nothing, I know I had a baby at 16 and all, but it didn't really make much of a matter. I still was pretty impressive after a baby at yes, 16. I had been Little Miss Perfect my whole life. Okay. Um, 
I had always gotten good grades. I had always, even when I was like having issues with my parents or having issues with running away, I still went to school. I still, you know, that, that um, foundation that they had instilled in me was very, very loud. And it was really hard for it to seem like overnight, the entire image I had worked to build, the reputation that I had created, the lifestyle that I had, you know, emulated for my entire upbringing was like, eh, doesn't exist. You're not that person. You don't get to be that person. It was difficult for me to process. And I think something people fail to realize is it doesn't matter how hard you think you can be on a person. There's not anyone in the world that can be harder on me than me. Mm -hmm. Um, There's not anybody that's going to take a loss or a devastation harder than I am, Um, especially as little humans mother, right? So it was really difficult for me to process this perception of me that was so opposite of who I thought I was. Mm-hmm. And I think that honestly, in retrospect, in some instances, I was so defiant. Mm-hmm. Um, it was like, I don't necessarily think I was wrong, but it wasn't necessary. It was like, I did things to be annoying. I did things to goad people. I did Mm. things to say, and not ever to start it, right? Because it was always like, I never asked anybody to bring their camera to me. Right. But it was like, you would say a little slick thing and I would be like, pop, pop, pop. You know, I know know we're on camera. (laughs) I know, right, and guess what? I'm about to pop you right Right. here, right now. And people don't like when you pop them on TV and people Uh don't like, not for nothing, strong black women who have no problem standing in their power and being like, no, actually, I know the law. I know what we're doing. I know what you're doing. People don't like that, Mm -hmm. especially when you're being accused loudly. Um, It was funny. So many times during the situation, Jaya would say like, you're like the black Donald Trump. Really? And I would be like, yeah, because she'd be like, you say anything. You say what you mean. You know, you're and I'd be like, well, isn't it funny how well it's working for him? I'm not understanding why I can't get a little more support. I'm not insane. Like, you know what I mean? Like, wow. And so it was very frustrating. Um, the other experience that I had that was really bad was. Wait, before we go to that, I want to I want to be more detailed and dissect this whole the first incident as far as because from my understanding, you had two flat. Take us to that night. Wasn't it two flat tires or something that you. It was a whole blowout. I was the so Your tires blew out. Yes. Okay. The take night, us there from there. It was so I had literally been on the bench for like a year. Bench. Okay. I had only been a judge for a year when I got arrested. Okay. Uh, people act like I had this lengthy tenure. I didn't. I was in. I was an enemy, and then I was out very mm. quickly. Um, so I had been on the bench for about a year, and it was a holiday weekend. It started snowing. I want to say like on a Thursday. And it kept snowing um, until that Tuesday. And it was like a blizzard. It was, I think it was a Monday. I don't remember what day of the week it was, but I know it was February 13th. And I got up and that is the anniversary, as I've said before, of my cousin's murder. Um, And it was a cousin that had campaigned with me and he never even got to see me on the bench. Mm -hmm. Um, I was elected and literally a month later he was killed. Mm, Sorry. Um, so, so it was a year later to the day and I got up that morning and I was like in a pissy mood and I had to go to work, but it was like seven o'clock in the morning. And I was like, before I go to work, I'm going to go to the gym. You know, I was trying to go to the gym heavy, falling off a little right now, but I was trying to go to the gym heavy back then. And I was like, if I go to the gym, it will start my day. It will be a good day. So I was driving to the gym. I was going to work after the gym. On the way to the gym, my tire blew out. I hit the median. I realized that, you know, I'm well, but I didn't realize I hit the median at the time. I thought that I hit the rumble strips, but I actually hit the median. So I pull over all the way with with only two tires, mind you, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're talking about my ability to properly operate a motor vehicle in a blizzard. Okay. I've got two tires on the right of my car. I pull over to the shoulder, clean to the shoulder call a friend. I'm like, you got to come get me. You got to bring me home. I have to get ready for work. I'm not dressed, nothing. And there's a blizzard. Okay. So you were in your right mind, sane enough to call a friend to come and get you from the side of the road. Yes. Because I had to work that morning. Okay. 
And I, I don't really like to Uber. I feel like if you have to Uber in your hometown, nobody loves you. <laughs> it's just a personal thing for me, but like I really don't <laughs> like it when I'm at home. So I called somebody and also I was like, initially, like I said, I didn't realize I had hit the median. Mm -hmm. I thought I just had a tire problem. I have tire problems all the time. It's a real issue for me because I hit curbs a lot. Just, that's okay. just how I drive. So I thought you can come, maybe you can change my tire. If you can't change my tire, then you're going to have to take me to go get dressed and everything so you can take me to work. I'll get my car later. Okay. While I'm waiting for my friend, a trooper pulls up. Swear to you. Now, at this point, I've been a DA. I've been a defense attorney. I've been a judge. I have a fairly good relationship with most of the police. I am not looking at this as any type of conflictual situation at all whatsoever. Mm -hmm. All of the cops know who I am. You know, most of them don't have issue with me. The trooper walks up. I don't know this particular trooper. I'm like, hey, I'm glad you're here. Maybe you could push your car over. I'm, I'm like, can you help me? You know, yeah. I'm thinking that you're here to help me. <clears throat> He's like, were you in an accident? Again, I don't know that I hit the median. So I'm like, no, my tire blew out. Because after my car blew out, I pulled over to the shoulder. And you never got out because it's cold out and blizzard. And it's right. It's snowing. So I never get out because my driver's side is to the the part where the cars are coming. Okay. You know what I mean? So I'm going to stay in my car until somebody else comes and makes a little barrier and whatever else. So I never get out. So he asked me to get out. When I get out, he's like, were you in an accident? I'm like, oh, shoot. <laughs> and he's like, he sees that I'm surprised. And I'm like, yeah, I must have hit the, you know, I must have hit the median. He's like, where are you going? I said, I'm going to, well, I got to go to court. No, oh. because now I have to go to court. Oh, the time passed. Right, because now it's um, after like eight something, you know what I mean? And I'm like, I've got, now I don't have time to go to the gym. I'm going, and, but he's, this is how I think we got to the confusion in the first place. Because I'm not traveling in the direction of going to the court from my house. You were going to the gym. And he initially. asked me, right, he asked me where I was coming from. And I told him I was coming from my house. I live off of Lake Avenue. I don't have to get on the expressway to go to court. But not for nothing, I've never gone to court at 7 o'clock in the morning in my whole life, ever. That's, court starts at 9.30. Mm -hmm. I usually roll in around 9.30. <laughs> you know, I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not a two and a half hour early kind of girl. Right. So, I don't think anybody's that early. Right. You, you know I struggle with punctuality. Yeah, so. That's why I'm so thankful. You were so on time. <laughs> I was trying. I was like, Mark is going to kill me. He's going <laughs> to never talk to me again. Um, so, yeah. So I struggle with that. So I'm just trying to answer his questions honestly, never thinking that we're conducting a DWI investigation at right. 7 o'clock in the morning. But also, I have on yoga pants. I didn't do my hair. I, you know, I'll roll out of bed some days. And, right. I'm just going to the gym. I was going to go back home and get ready before I went to court. So I didn't care. And just the, the situation very quickly progressed. I think that he felt that I was being rude to him. Mm. Uh, and honestly, I felt that he was being rude to me. So when people be rude to me, you match your energy. As I previously indicated, mm -hmm. I got a little pop, pop attitude. So I think I popped him a couple of times and he was like, you don't get to pop me, little black girl in a raggedy old Hyundai. Who do you think you are? Because <laughs> remember, it didn't matter that I was a judge. Yeah. I was driving a 2000, I think a 2008 Hyundai. Mm -hmm. And I had been driving it. Jaya had been driving it. I had hit the house before. Like it, it was not so in good condition. I just want to interject here because you, you hit you hit medians a lot you hit the house of I'm course the, the viewers are looking driver. like is this because she's drunk do you do you have these hits because you were drunk at the time no okay. i just am not the best at you know okay. i drive a little bit distracted okay and it's not necessarily just because people always think I'm and on i my noticed phone. that on your live because you <laughs> like to be in your seatbelt you jamming i'm singing, dancing i'm putting and on i often chapstick. watch your live like is she watching the role so i could not i put on chapstick i and i won't be paying the most attention now on this particular day there was really a bad blizzard mm -hmm. and i'm not going to pretend You're that i'm now. good yeah. at keeping good care of my tires though i mm -hmm. think that i think that i'm like one of those females that has mm -hmm. bald tires a lot and I did not have a husband anymore. So okay. that was now my job. And that was like, that's still one of the hardest things for me for right. not having a husband anymore. Being like. <laughs> but also just as a disclaimer, I don't think we should have curbs because why are they even there? <laughs> They're there for you to hit. They're just like to ruin your life. Lip safeguards. Nobody's going to jump that far. <laughs> that was on purpose. If you jumped that far, that was intentional. <laughs> so you and the guy now matching each other's energy. You and the 
trooper. Oh, yeah, but this is brief, right? Mm-hmm. So he says to me, did you get an accident? I say, no. He says, um, look at your car. I say, oh, I-, I must have hit the median when my tire blew out. He said, you didn't know. I said, I didn't get out my car. I'm trying to remember now because this was honestly like nine right. years ago. Um, and he asked me, he says, he says to me at some point, very early in the conversation, because we didn't talk for more than three minutes. He says, why do you smell fruity? Mm. And I said, I'm a black woman. I wear mango butter on my body. I wear, you know, coconut oil. What, what fruit are you smelling? Right. I don't know. But again, I don't know what conversation we're having. I know he's just being kind of weird. Mm-hmm. He's asking me questions. He's not actually helping me. You know, I don't understand. This isn't the way I expected the conversation to go. But when he asked me to get out of my car, I did, I complied, but my phone was in my car. I didn't get it. And so, um, and also I didn't have my ID with me at the time, Mm, Wow. which I know, you know, I've got these. And these are all things that if you know me, they add up because that happens because I have some issues like my my ID's in the back of my phone right now so that I don't lose it because it was lost for a while. Um, But, but so I didn't have my ID with me, but I told him, you can look it up. I know my ID number by heart. I told it to him. You can look it up. I literally know it by heart. Yes. I said, it's been lost for a little bit. My whole court ID has been lost for a little bit. Um, so I go to get back in my car and he's like, no, I want you to come get in my car. Now you're no. a judge at this time and past attorney. So you know that that's and not I, appropriate. And I know that my car can't move. Okay. So like the only reason for you to ask me to get in your car is because you think I'm going to take off, but my car doesn't have tires. Like you just pointed out. Mm-hmm. So my car is not going anywhere. I'm not going to drive it away like this. You know, I can't get away from you. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So why would I sit in your car? And I said, no, thank you. I'm going to sit in my car. You can look up the information. My friend's on the way. And I go to open my door. And he said, um, well, then you're under arrest. And I said, for what? Now I'm getting angry. Is that for DWI? And I'm like, you have literally no probable cause for DWI. Wait, so he hadn't took a breathalyzer or anything yet? No, so no. So he just put that on you, DWI. He said that the there was a the fruity conversation. smell. And he never said this to me, but that I, I believe that he used the fact that he believed I was traveling in the wrong right. direction for where I was going. As lying. Right. And, right. So he thinks I'm confused about the direction. Plus okay. there's an accident. So these three things coupled. Okay. But I had to put this together forever because there's not enough probable cause there. You know what I mean? You didn't take any field sobriety tests right. and you can't develop probable cause after an arrest. Mm. You have to have enough probable cause before you arrest me. You can't arrest me and then get more information after to say now there's enough. You know what I mean? Right. And see, this is why I'm glad I wanted you to walk us through this. I wanted her eavesdroppers to walk us through this because it's very important to hear these details of how it happened because we didn't get all this. We just got drunk driving and we just, I assumed all this time that they took a breathalyzer and came up with it and, and but they stamped it on you per conversation and per thoughts. You well, know. we had, so that the arrest happens then he says, you know, you can get arrested for resisting arrest or you can get in the car. So I get in the car, but now I'm kind of scared, you know, mm-hmm. now I'm like, what is happening? And I don't have access to my phone and I don't know how long it's going to take my friend to get here. And I'm in the back of a trooper's car who's, you know, I don't feel treating me properly. And I'm like freaking out a little bit. And so I'm like, okay, wait a minute. Wait, you, you don't, you don't know what you're doing. Which is a wonderful thing to say to somebody. (laughs) You don't want to insult them. I'm like, you're a morning guy. You don't know what you're doing. You clearly don't even do DWIs because you're a morning guy. Give me field sobriety test. And so, so we you do, ask for a field sobriety test. I asked for a field sobriety test. He goes, uh, well, you can do the standardized ones. I said, see, this is what I mean. If you know the NHTSA handbook, mm. the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, you know that you can't just ask me to do any test. You have to ask me if I have any injuries. I have a brain injury. I can't do the field sobriety tests that require balance because I don't have proper balance. I have a brain injury, which if you know the rules, you would know that. And so he says to me, oh, you, you work in the courts and you got a brain injury? So no, I'm pissed. Insult. And like, you're so disrespectful. I didn't say that I had any type of developmental disability. Mm-hmm. I said I have a brain injury, but I turned around 
and showed him. You know, I have. I, know you've seen I didn't know you. Had, so I'm, I'm trying to get there. Yeah. So this is this. OK, yeah, that's this guy. So mm-hmm. I go, do you think I just created that for you? Or do you think that I actually have? And, and so then but this is just escalating. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So then we do the alphabet test. Uh, we do the counting tests. I pass both of them. I'm still under arrest. So then we just wait for my friend to come. He's an attorney. He gets there. He's like, she's not talking to you anymore. Um, we sit, we wait longer. He has a guy, because I wasn't wrong, he doesn't take roadside. I mean, he doesn't do DWIs. He has another trooper come to bring a roadside device. Hmm. The road After si- you said that, though, he saw that you were knowledgeable. Well, no, the roadside devices, honestly, I was never going to take because they're not admissible. Okay. Um, they're just to detect whether or not there's alcohol in your breath. And they're not admissible in court. So there's no benefit to take them at all. But I sat there and argued with the lawyer that was in the car with me. And he's like, you know, he said, if you take this, he'll, he'll unarrest you. Now, this is not something I really believe in, honestly. Um, but I've never been a judge where you get special privileges or people, you know, give you the benefit of the doubt mm-hmm. instead of assuming. So I'm like, maybe this is like some judge thing where like I've proven my innocence enough to not be, you know what I mean? Cause I don't believe in an unarrest. Now I think that once I did the field sobriety test, that was the appropriate time for him to say, mm. wait a minute. But once I've been sitting here for two or three hours, I don't think I'm unarrested. I think you've called all your trooper friends. You know what I mean? I've seen a billion troopers on the side of the road. So I don't believe him. But I listened to the attorney that I'm with. We take the test about four times. After the fourth time, he says, no, uh, it detects alcohol. You're under arrest. After the fourth try. But there's no, this is why it's not admissible. Because there's no record. There's no printout. There's no, it's just the officer's word about what they see. So why do you feel that's very important right there, which you just exposed to us? Like, part of this... This was your fall from grace, your introduction to the fall from grace. But listening to it, you didn't fall. Well, the thing that was annoying to me, right, was that the way things were presented, like it was presented that I did take a breathalyzer. I I didn't take a breathalyzer. That's not a a breathalyzer. That's a roadside pre-screen. But the media reported a breath test result that, you know, so it was there were all these times where people got portions of the story that sounded so egregious. Mm -hmm. And it was just like. Oh, you're so stupid. You're so stupid. And it's like, look, I have been a lot of things in my life. Okay. I have been fat. I've been undesirable. <laughs> I've been a nerd. I have, but I've never been stupid. That mm-hmm. is not. And so it was so insulting to be like, stupid. Oh, I'm stupid. <laughs> am, I, am I freaking soldier boy? Am I stupid? Oh, no. <laughs> like, that was the worst thing. You know what I mean? That I could have been. I was always the smartest kid. And it was so hurtful because it was all over. And it was like, it was also so hurtful because I had literally only been on the bench for a year. So I had just campaigned and met most of these people because I literally worked my ass off talking to all of them, sending them literature, telling them everything about me and why they should pick me. Mm. And it's like, you all met me. Most of you met me in real life and I stood and talked to you. And so you didn't want to talk anymore about issues and how I felt and what I thought in and here you just aren't even listening to the facts of the case. You just hate me from the outset because somebody told you to. And I think that's how it became about a race mm-hmm. thing so easily because it was a DWI. It was a misdemeanor DWI. You've seen a million non-people of color get arrested for them and they disappear since mm-hmm. then. And mine was all over. It was over. so sensationalized. And everybody was like, you just... You won't stop. And it was like, I, I can't stop. I can't do anything. I can't go. I went and got a tattoo. It was on the news. I went like everything I did became news. And that was really frustrating. So at some point you just thought, since you guys are going to create this fiasco or circus, I'm going to play in it. And you know, really, I don't think it was an intention to play in it. I think that when people are rude to me, mm-hmm. I think I'd be rude back to them. And I was antagonized a lot. And even when I would try to be nice to people, it would be something later that night that they published or that they wrote, they would be nice to me off camera. And then it would be some nasty story about how, you know, and I was like, this is getting on my nerves. Really trying to villainize you. I felt 
very villainized. And I feel like that's very inconsistent with my entire persona mm-hmm. and everything about who I really am. So that was really frustrating to me. Wow. So now we're, we're coming into, you're in the media heavy, as you said. Um, so what was the actual conviction and punishment, if you will? So it happened repeatedly. It happened, the initial conviction was DWI okay. and a conditional discharge. Mm-hmm. Now, very shortly after that, that, that happened in August, I want to say, the conviction. Um, by October, there were violations. Because you're on probation. That's no. Oh, you were on probation. I was not on probation, Convicted. but I had, an, I had an ignition interlock inside of my vehicle, okay, that was which monitors that. you. Hmm. And so after the conviction, and I, I think I've been candid about this, but after the conviction, prior to the conviction, I was totally fine. I wasn't worried about it. I didn't see any possible way um, viewing the evidence in the light most favorable to the people, which is a standard that they could possibly prove me guilty of anything. I did not see any modicum of a chance as a judge, as a defense attorney, as a prosecutor who had done DWIs in the felony bureau. Didn't see it. Didn't see it happening. Um, and don't think that it happened in real life. I think that that was totally a setup, but didn't see that coming. After the trial, I was a mess. Mm. And I was very clear about that. I very rarely left my house at all. And I begged my employer to allow me to go into an inpatient facility. Mm. Begged, begged, and begged. And they were like, no. Now, prior to, they were like, you have to. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm not going to. I didn't get convicted of anything. I didn't actually do this. But after, that was a whole different story. First of all, I had been told I was an alcoholic for like the last two years. I had been dragged. I had been embarrassed. I had been humiliated. And what I had found is that, and I had never really drank heavy like that before. I'd only drank wine. What I found is that I could drink and not feel anything, not even exist. You know what I mean? Just like disappear and not. And I was not capable of processing anything that I was feeling at that time. People often think that you're drunk. They often think that, like all the time, right now. Are you drunk now? No. Right. See, that's what I mean. People <laughs> often think that people you're, think you're drunk. that I have too good an attitude, and people think I'm too authentic. In my own personal opinion, people think that I joke about things that are inappropriate because they want to be sad about them. I guess, and I, that's just not my personality. Right. To be miserable or sad about stuff. Because I've been around you in personal space now, and I don't. It was amazing to see that you weren't what were, you were depicted, meaning as far as the alcohol. Um, I, I saw you socially and, and entertained, and you kept well balanced with that. That was so far from what is being depicted. I, I was going to throw up somewhere and go sleep. Right. I thought you would be staggering somewhere, holding your shoes, <laughs> and you know, just out of control. And I've been, again, on the scene with you more than once, and I socially, and I don't see that. Well, I think that. Undoubtedly, on the day that there were violations, right, this was, I would get off of work on Friday because remember I was working, but I wasn't allowed to work. Mm -hmm. I was going to work and I was sitting in a cubicle being tortured all day long Mm -hmm. and and being treated like crap. And, you know, I wasn't actually allowed to do a job. Um, They were having me do law clerk work when they did give me work to do, which I was not a law clerk. I was an elected official and they Mm -hmm. were giving me work that was assigned to my subordinate. So it was difficult Mm -hmm. during this time. And I would literally leave work on Friday, go home, get drunk. My kids are old, right? Mm-hmm. I don't have babies. Get drunk until Sunday. Sunday, mo- Sunday night, be like, okay, I got to go to work in on Monday. In my own home. In my own home. Drunk right. in your own home. And I didn't go anywhere. But on Monday, I'd have to get up and go. And I'd get up and I'd take my kids to school and I'd go to uh, the gym and I'd go like to all of my appointments and stuff. But at this time... I had already been determined not to have a drug or alcohol problem by several OASIS certified people because they kept making me go to the the counselors. I hadn't been qualified for any type of counseling. I couldn't get any assistance from my employer because they refused to help me. I had gone to see a doctor um, because my employer made me go see a doctor to see about my fitness for work. He said the best thing that could happen for her is some more normalcy. Let her go back to work. And they told me I wasn't allowed in the building anymore. Mm. So it was a bunch of very difficult events where it was like, no. erupting. Right. And it's like, I can't do this. I can't handle this. I'm just going to sit in my house and disappear for a little bit. I'm not going to, you know, I'm I'm not. And I've said it before that it was a very low time that I felt like I considered suicide. Mm. That I was like, 
my kids will be millionaires. Mm. I just want them to be taken care of. So I don't have policy. To, right. I'm like, they'll be fine. I'll die a judge. They'll have insurance. I could just end this all right now. I don't want to do this. Mm. Um, but I, I didn't feel like that was fair to them. Right. Mm. So it would be like, I need a little escape from this. I need a little bit of time to not feel like everybody in the world hates me for no apparent reason, for something that had nothing to do with them, that in no way impacted them at all. You know what I mean? Like this, I can't wrap my mind around the craziness that this experience is. So you went away for like some peace and journey. Is that when we have insert Thailand? So, so we have that conviction, right? I plead guilty to that. That's not a conviction. I plead guilty. But then we have a myriad of charges after that, um, that are all dismissed, Mm. but I keep getting charged, keep getting charged. Like, like at the dick store with a shotgun. That that was not one of them. That's after Thailand, but there's one where I was in papayas, which is a nightclub, which I'm allowed to be in. And I didn't drink anything all night, but the security guard said that he thought that I was swinging. I'm in a nightclub so everyone's dancing with my sister. Right. Um, and they literally went to Ontario County to interview him and mm. brought him back. And like, I just kept getting charged with stuff and kept getting arrested, but it all kept getting dismissed. And that's important for us to hear. All of those charges kept getting dismissed. And that's what we don't hear. We don't. They don't come back and report that. Right. But everybody keeps hearing it. And they're right. like, she just won't stop. Right. She won't stop. We can't stand her. She doesn't care. And I'm like, every time this happens, I'm furious. And everybody's like, why is she so furious? Why is she so arrogant? Why? And I'm like, I'm not getting convicted of anything. This is a misdemeanor DWI, just like you and everybody you know has. I already said I didn't even do this. I'm getting tired of being punished now. You know, like, I'll take my licks. Mm-hmm. You could beat me a little bit. Fine. I lost. But you can't just beat me to death. Right. And it had gotten to a point where the media was so assisting in people being egregious to you and like hating you. They were even finding your address and pulling up to your home. The media published my address because the New York Unified Court System gave it to them. They gave them my home address. They gave them my license number. They gave them my driver's license number. They gave them my unredacted uh, paperwork. My job did. So what were some of the uh, unwarranted visits. What, what, when this give me one, someone popped up to your home and what? I had one person come over. Well, this was, he wanted legal advice. Um, he said that the police were looking for him. He was wanted at the time, but that's really scary Mm -hmm. to have people do. I've had strangers come over and say that they, um, had seen me on the news. They knew that that was my house and they just wanted to meet me. Um, and it's, it's just creepy. You know, I I don't like any threats or anything. People have posted threats online. I'm none of them have actually address. come. Okay. Yeah, none of them. They posted my address online. Hmm. They've posted, let's Doxing. all go to her. Yeah, but they've never actually come to my house from in a, with any ill intent or to do anything. Because I was thinking at that point, I remember hearing you say, or it was written somewhere, that you felt you had to go to Dick's and try to get some type of protection because your address was all over. It was. Okay, and yet before that, you didn't have own any weapons in your home no i still don't actually i'm okay. terrified of guns but you felt at that point you needed protection i went to no dicks yeah i went to dicks to go get more information definitely about what types of opportunities i could have to protect myself because there were multiple this was in april so this we're jumping ahead now but mm-hmm. it was after all of the judges in new york state got a raise and they published a photo of me and said that i hadn't been to work in x number of days because i wasn't allowed to go to work but that I had gotten a raise. Oh, they didn't like that. Well, every judge got the raise, but I wasn't allowed to go to work. So there wasn't anything I could do. You know, they're like, the Stasio hasn't been at work in 184 days. How did she get a raise? Right. Okay. Everybody did. So let's fast forward to Thailand because that was big. People was like, the audacity and the nerve of her to go to Thailand as if she just was not on probation. Actually, and I, and I wasn't on probation. But that is, I think, the last thing that prompted it. I, I think that was because I went to Thailand in May. I went to Thailand because it was my birthday and I had had the incident where I had pled guilty to the drinking. But then after that, I like had gone to, I had gone into a program voluntarily because they wouldn't send me to one. And I had kind of chilled with that. I really felt, and I was in therapy. My therapist felt that me drinking had way more to do with depression than it had to do with substance abuse. He's mm. like, you're not even trying to have a good time. You're sitting in your house by yourself. You know what I mean? He's like, right. this is like classic 
depression. depression. And I don't know who wouldn't be depressed mm -hmm. in this situation because this is insane, you know? Um, so I was kind of sad and it was my birthday and I was feeling like a loser. I had just gotten elected and it, I wasn't even allowed to go to work and I just couldn't get this situation over with. And I was like, you know what? I keep getting arrested no matter what I do. I know what I'll do. I'll get the hell out of here. I know where you guys can't bother me, where you can't come sit on my porch, where you can't have strangers call me. I'll go someplace else. I'll fill my cup. I'll find me some peace. So honestly, the funny part is I meant to go to Bali mm. because I had read Eat, Pray, Love. And I thought that was a great book, but I'm not too great on details all the time. And my geography is not great. <laughs> so I went to the Mine whole either. wrong country. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, I went to Thailand and I meant to go to Bali, <laughs> but I literally decided like on May, I think on May 1st that I was going and got there on May 3rd. And it wasn't your like- Your birthday's a, in May. My birthday's May 1st. Okay. So I think I decided on that day, like, I'm going to get out of here. I'm tired of this. I don't need this crap. I can pay all the bills. Like I said, my kids were old. I'm like, I'll, Jaya can have the car. She can take Corey back and forth to school. You know what I mean? I'm going to go take a break. And then when they get out of school, because I was going in May, they were just getting out in June, they can come and we'll come back in August when I'm allowed to go back to work because then I'll have, you know, a purpose and be able to do stuff again. And I don't have to keep dealing with this. So, so when you came back, why were they acting like you violated? Because this has been a series of attempts to ruin my life and I don't have the venue to talk louder than they do. So they could or they could essentially try to. Ultimately, they weren't successful. But when I came back, what happened essentially is the judge ordered that I take an alcohol test that he had never back. ordered I take mm -hmm. in Monroe County. He ordered it knowing that I was in Thailand. Mm -hmm. And he, or, which he, he didn't have the authority to do. He, he couldn't tell me where to take it. He could just tell me to take it because he couldn't order me to stay in Monroe County. That wasn't part of my sentence. But he ordered me to take it in Monroe County anyway. And he ordered that on Friday at 530. And I needed to be in Monroe County on Tuesday at 930. I was already in Thailand and he knew I was in Thailand. And Monday was a holiday. So that's completely illegal. And I think that's part of what people got frustrated with with me. I know the law. So it would be like, well, it doesn't matter if the judge ordered you to. No, the judge can't order me to do something he's not allowed to order me to do. He can't give me zero days notice that I have to be in court when he knows I'm in a different country. That's totally illegal. So what's your rebuttal when people say, but she knows as a black woman that we, we can't do what they do? Yeah, no, I don't believe in that. The law is the law. Okay. I think it's so funny. I want to see somebody go to get evicted and say that they don't need to be properly served when they get kicked out their house. I bet you they're going to want every single mm -hmm. day of their service. But I get to go to jail because you gave me no business day's notice? No, there's laws and there's procedures. And what frustrated me was that those were blatantly not followed in my case. Mm -hmm. And it was ignored on a national level. And they people might not have known they should have because they were familiar with misdemeanor dwis because so many have had them but professionals definitely knew mm. and just were like yeah i'm gonna sit this one out i'm gonna sit this one out oh she's being so crazy as opposed to being like this is a little insane there was only one person on um, judicial commission he said she's appealing this dwi and she's gonna win on appeal this is so thin and they said, no, the appeal's already been denied because the judge who heard my appeal was also hand-selected from Ontario County. Just a lot of weird little, you know, things where I was like, I knew that they controlled the process, but I didn't know they would do it so loudly and blatantly. Just some yes or no questions here. Just direct because Eve Joppers is going to want to know this and just to the point. Do you have mental health issues? Um, I think that's a difficult question because I think let pretty me, much everyone has mental health issues. Let me rephrase it. Do you have mental illness? Um, I don't, I don't think so. I don't know if there's a distinction. I've definitely had issues with depression. Um, that throughout, would be mental health. Right. Throughout my life. I don't, I guess I wouldn't know what's the distinction with mental illness. Mental then. illness more falls into the category of crazy, they would say. I'm putting quotes around it. Crazy. Uh, like, you mean like schizophrenia? Yelling at yourself, voices going live. Oh. <laughs> going live, making like random posts or random, just rambling on on your lives and making people think like, is she okay? Like that's more mental illness. 
So do you have you ever been diagnosed or suffer from any mental illness, taking any meds for mental illness? No. OK. Are you an alcoholic? I don't think so. But I don't have a degree in that. So I don't like to, you know, okay. pretend that I know things like that. OK, because when someone think alcoholic, like you're just always drinking every day, hiccuping. And just, you know, just always drunk, you no know, matter what the day of the week it's is. It's funny to me because people make that assertion so much. And I am always like, I function in such professional mm -hmm. environments on such a regular basis. Mm -hmm. I would think that if that was an issue, it would have been more prevalent. And I think that it's so odd that people bought this hook, line, and sinker when it had never been an issue for 33 years of my life. It only mm -hmm. became an issue once I got this job. And it ceased to be an issue once I stopped having it. Isn't that mm -hmm. weird? Right. I do sometimes see you say, and I like this one post I saw you say, calling me a drunk, thinking it's a flex is a ha ha. I'm just paraphrasing something like that. Well, people like to say it like they're insulting me. And it's mm -hmm. like, you can't insult me if I'm doing better than you right. in any capacity. <laughs> if my life looks better than yours on any level, you I can't. can't even hear you up here. Right. Okay. I like that. I can't <laughs> hear you up here. Yeah. Okay. So now we're to a point where you have been. You've, you've come against all these challenges. You've come against, and again, it's very important to know that you weren't charged. A lot of these were dropped. Um, no, I was charged, and I had litigated it and right. ultimately was found to be not guilty. It was, right. They didn't drop anything. They charged me with everything they could. And what, that thanks to you having a good attorney at the time? is what No, it was, it was, I repeatedly got, and I don't want to say I didn't have a good attorney, but I okay. had issues with a lot of my attorneys. Right. But they charged me with things that, I mean, even the judge, who I think was very much against me, issued a decision saying the lack of evidence in this case isn't sufficient to charge anyone in this country with an offense. But mind you, he's the one who signed the warrant for my arrest. Okay, like, you were wow. supposed to decide that before you issued yes, a warrant. Yeah. So, you know, there were interesting things like that where I would be so confused about where the case was going. Like, OK, did you guys finally punish me enough? Right. And that's why I talk about trauma. Sometimes when you've had issues in your life with trauma, with abuse, you realize, OK, I'm not going to win this fight. I have to just eat this. You know, I'm going to lose this war. I'm going to eat my crow and move on because you're in the position of power here. So at some point it became to feel very much like at work, at least. I have to be punished and tortured and treated horribly until I've paid enough, but not by everybody in the whole world, not by right. the media. You know what right. I mean? Okay, you guys want to treat me like trash at work. You want to do little funny stuff to me, but I'm not about to let everybody, the homeless man gets to tell me <laughs> I'm worthless. You know, like, are you serious? Right. Get in line right. and insult me today? Right. <laughs> so hearing that at work, currently, from what I know, all attorneys go through the main go through an entrance that's specifically for the attorney down in the city court. There's, it's actually not even just attorneys. It's attorneys and employees. Okay. So the secretaries get to go the through staff. it. The, yeah, the staff get to go through the special door. Except you. Except me. To this day, you are the exception to not go through the door downtown in the city courts. You have to go through where the regulars go through. And that's intentional. Please elaborate on that. Like, why are they causing you to not have the benefit of the full staff at the city court? I don't have a reason other than that. Um, I think that when this situation occurred, I, I think that unbeknownst to me, right, when they said, go to rehab right now, do this, do this, this is what you have to do. I think that those were not suggestions. And we had already had issues previously with them giving me suggestions and me being like, do you need a dictionary? Because that's not a suggestion. If you're telling me I have to do it, command. right, then you have to tell me that I have to do it. And you also have to tell me why you get to tell me I have to do it because I don't think you're my boss. Mm -hmm. I think when they came to me with that suggestion, that was my final here. We are, we are in a position of power now. Now, you've made it clear to us that we're not the boss of you. You're not going to play by our rules. You're not going to judge the way we say. Now we have the upper hand and you do this. And again, I was defiant. And so I think unbeknownst to me, it was over from right then. It was over from when I said that no. And the intention was for me to not be able to practice. Um, they say that to remove a judge from the bench is literally career suicide. Mm. You're not usually able to have a successful, thriving law practice after that. 
you're not able as you do right you're not usually sucked up by a firm which i wasn't you know nobody came and said hey are you okay let me take care of you i know this kind of stuff i wasn't sucked up by a firm but usually your reputation is so damaged and so tarnished and also you're so defeated personally right that you're like i don't have it i'll get up and move i'll get up and leave i'll go to another jurisdiction and i'll practice there because i've, I've fallen from grace like you said you know what i mean i can't take the time people say that all the time why bother staying here mm -hmm. and I other places yeah in other places people would treat you so much differently and better and so yeah you you aren't supposed to recover and i think that there's bitterness about the fact that i still practice here right so was there email something sent to you to say you have to use you can't use this exit did you try to no. go through there one day and they no you so there's a card that you apply for mm -hmm. and i've applied for it probably five times now mm. And they generally just ignore my application. Mm -hmm. So it just makes you go through the entrance with even right. your clients. Right, because I don't have the That's card. That's crazy. Like sometimes you're walking in and you're with your clients. Yeah, yeah. I literally walked in with my clients today. Um, mm. and, and it's it's a little bit disheartening, but I, I was saying, you know, today when I walked in, I was in line behind my clients and I hadn't met them yet, but they knew what I looked like. Mm -hmm. So he introduced himself and there was a few people in between us. And they were like, oh, judge, come on, go ahead. And they, they mm -hmm. let me walk around them. And it was like, you know, it wasn't a huge line. Um, so I was waiting anyway. But it's always so nice for people to go out of their way to, to see you are being treated super mm -hmm. unfairly. And I'm so like the, the lady, I saw her again later and she was like, you inspired me today. Mm -hmm. I can't believe that you can do this every day and you're so strong. And I was just like, oh. But, you know, that's so beautiful. You never know who's seeing your struggle and how it's just like, it used to bother me so much. It still bothers me now when I'm late and I'm late a lot. It's frustrating, especially on trial. But now it's just like, whatever. You guys are trying to bother me. I can't let you annoy me. Sadly, it's just putting me in the frame of Hattie McDaniels back in the racism times of how the Oscars, they made her go through the back door of the Oscars to even get her Oscar. To get her and, award, and right. And even air it. Um, so I, it sounds similar. It's, it's you know sad what? today that we're still dealing with that. There's a, there's a, a document that comes out called the good news report. Um, and it's published about local attorneys who get wins in the community on trials, on, you know, suppression issues on, and it's so funny because I've literally never been in it, never, ever mm. been in it once. And same, I'll be going to my trial to find out that my client's coming home and I have to wait in line and the jurors walk past me and see me standing mm. in line with the defendants. You know what I mean? And wow. it's like, what message are you trying to send? There's, there's a very clear, loud message that you're trying to send. So these are something, these are some uh, hurdles that you, tr you hop every day. Yeah. Every day you're still being strong through it all. You're still dealing with meeting a state trooper that put such a wrong stigma on you to this day, you're still dealing with it. All this what's happening today is because of that one incident of you hitting, a, accidentally hitting a curb and busting your tires. And now being seen as a DWI. And it has trickled down to, as we sit here, you're no longer a judge, but I love that someone said to you, hey judge, you can come first. So how does that feel to hear that culturally speaking, or just even from anybody that still says they still holding on to your title. How does that feel? You know, it, I say this all the time. Generally, once you're an elected, you keep that, that right. title. Like people will right. say the you're honorable, still my mayor. You're you still keep, my right. President. You keep, you keep the title, but because there was such an effort to disparage me and to, to be like, you know, such just horrible destruction to my name. And it, it's nice because it's an intentional form of respect. Yes. You know what I mean? Like it's like, yeah, it's in, in, it's funny because when I first became a judge, I was so uncomfortable with being called judge. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, oh, you know, the attorneys all the start to itself. call you judge. Yeah. yeah they, and I was like, just call me Leticia, just call yeah. me Leticia. And now when people call me Leticia and I don't know them, I'm like, you know, it's right, like I'm used right, to everybody right, calling right. me judge now. <laughs> so as we conclude here, the I know people want to know, how did you get the news or how did they what was the reason for making you step down from judge back to an attorney? What was the actual reason and process of doing? It? Well, so I didn't step down. Well, I mean, I was they, I was removed. Right. Um, so, I'm sorry. Removed. So yeah. How was 
how did that happen? How, would, how did you get that news? Um, you mean literally when I found out? Yes. I was in my house hiding because I didn't come out of my house at this point like at all. And if you didn't call first, I didn't open the door. And they sent a deputy to my house to bring me like a box mm. of stuff. And I ignored them because I didn't know who it was. And then I went to leave to bring my kid to the dentist in the deputy because he was literally stalking me. Like they just, they had him sit in front of my house until I came out, came and was like, oh, we've got a box for you. I was going to bring my kids to the dentist. So I shoved the box into the back seat, go to the dentist and it's on the news. And I'm like, oh, all righty then, guess I'm not doing that anymore. And what was, they, what was the actual reasons they said for removing you? They said, they said it wasn't just the DWI. Mm -hmm. They were adamant about that the whole time because the DWI was incredibly weak. And so I think it was always a concern that if I won on appeal and I got removed over a DWI I didn't commit, then what? You know what I okay. mean? So they looked, at, um, they looked at some other cases and they said that I had improper conduct on the bench, but primarily it was all of the offenses that continued to occur after the DWI and behaviors that they said were inappropriate for the continued offenses. They, the reason didn't make a ton of sense to me, honestly, because there's not many judges who have been removed for a DWI. And at the end of the day, that's all I was convicted of. Mm -hmm. So the rest of it doesn't make sense. Um, I believe they said I tried to use my judicial office for my own personal gain. Mm. But the trooper testified that he didn't know I was a judge at the hearing. He testified that I didn't tell him mm. I was a judge, that the person who came to get me told him. So that didn't make sense to me. And at, by the time it was over, though, I just was like, this is all just a show. You know, this has been over and I was the only person who didn't know. Right. So now with the, you're back to practicing law. At one point, you had a 13 in a row winning streak. What is your streak as we speak? What are your stats now that you're back practicing law? Okay, so as a defense attorney, since I've been back out, I've only done three trials. Um, I've won, well, I've done three trials. One of them was the same trial twice. Okay. I won two and lost one. Okay. I lost the one that I tried twice. The first time I won it, the second time I lost it. Okay. And so you're still in demand then these days. Oh, yeah. I've got a very busy trial schedule. Unfortunately, crime is incredibly prevalent in Rochester. And right now, everybody's getting arrested for criminal possession of a weapon. And they don't make offers on that often. So you kind of have to go to trial. And so what's, what's to come? What's to come for Leticia? What do you have coming up? What are you doing these days besides practicing law? I am trying to simmer down on some projects um, and finish things that I've started so that I can try new projects. Okay. But right now I'm trying to um, control my practice because like I said, it is growing a lot. And I mean, I've talked to you about some of the things that I've supposedly had in the works, but okay. I've been procrastinating forever and mm -hmm. ever. So for this sure. year I'm supposed to get things done in real life. Okay. Okay. So there's, if we conclude here, I just want you to be able to look into your camera there. And speak to the young lady coming up that's going to face trials, possibly how to overcome them. How do you succumb things of this as a woman of color, as you did? You know, I think it's important that you remember to give yourself grace and compassion. I think that one of the things that I've come to realize as an older woman at this point um, that has gone through some experiences is that so many of us suffer from imposter syndrome mm -hmm. because we're told that we're inadequate or we're insufficient or we're not smart enough or pretty enough or thin enough or good enough in whatever way. And we internalize that message and we are generally the most prepared, the most attractive, the most educated, uh, the most articulate. We're usually the most on the ball because we've always been told that we weren't. So give yourself some grace, mm. give yourself some compassion, and know that when you fall down, you have to get back up. Words of wisdom. But I would like to say to you, from me having an encounter with you and sharing your personal space, I thank you for that because I do see you as inspirational as well. But okay. I need you to know you are necessary. You are necessary. And I'll say it again, you are necessary to the community. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you for being here to mark my words. Thank you. All right. When I talk, they listen. This is what they've been missing. This podcast is what they've been missing. When I talk, they listen. This is what they've been missing. 
This podcast is what they've been missing. When I talk, they listen. This is what they've been missing. This podcast, this is what they've been missing. When I talk, they listen. This is what they've been missing. This podcast is what they've been missing. Word, word.